Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. We've just continued, we've finished a series on the book of Judges. Boy, what a series that was of, of a lot of trouble with a lot of things happening in context. But as we looked at the book of Judges, we saw the cycle of sin and how God brings us salvation. Sin leads to slavery. Pray to God, and God sends a Savior to save us. And that cycle continued time and time again. And in our lives, the cycle happens as well. And the question we need to ask is, how do we break the cycle? And we see in our story uh, uh, a woman who was caught in adultery, and Jesus tells her, go and sin no more. The cycle can be broken. So we're going to look at that today. Now, after we finish... The judges, uh, now today we're going to look at how a woman's life was changed by the cycle being broken. And then next week we're going to take a look at Jesus, who is the judge. All of the judges in the book of Judges foreshadow the real judge to come, the, the, the judge who can save us. Next week we'll look at John 19 with Jesus on the cross and see that it was there with the mercy of God that he actually saves us. So we'll look at that next week. But for this morning, let's take a look at John chapter 8. Follow along with me. Listen to the word of the Lord. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the, law of Moses, the law of Moses commands us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question to, as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left and the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so we have a woman who is brought to Jesus, and at the end of that scene, Jesus asks her a very important question, or, or, or gives her a command. Go and sin no more. And she has a choice. What will she decide to do? We're not given the end of the story. We don't know what happened to this woman. One day, I suppose we will know, but we don't know for now. But when we look at what Jesus is doing, he is freeing her up from sin and the slavery to sin. And for her, it was actually almost immediate death. And Jesus became her savior. But she had a decision to make. When I look at God in the book of Judges, I, I, I sometimes wonder how God must get frustrated with the Israelites because they couldn't make a decision of whom to follow, whom to worship. They went from one to the other. Yesterday, we had a new members seminar, and uh, after we were done that afternoon, I got in my car and went down the street and uh, turned down Orange Grove, and as I was coming down the road, a gray squirrel jumped off the curb and ran uh, and, and stopped right in front of my car. Well, I had time, so I hit the brake, and I slowed down, and then the squirrel took off and ran back to the curb again. And then as I moved up a little more, the squirrel ran right in front of my car again and then ran to the curb again, then ran again into my car as I slammed on the brake. Finally, as I hit the brake and halted, all of the things were hurled in my car against the front windshield, and I slammed on the brakes. The squirrel took off, made it to the other side, and I was frustrated. Now, the squirrel was fine. I was happy about that. And I won't tell you a story like I did last week where I had a conversation with a spider and a fly. You remember that? I didn't have a conversation, but I'll tell you this. I did say words to that squirrel. <laughs> I actually said, ah, would you just make up your mind? And as I drove away, I started thinking, you know, I'll bet that's the, that's the way God must have felt with the Israelites. Time and time. Would you just make up your mind? And sometimes I think God says that to us as well. We read in the, the history of Israel that their actions almost got them killed time and time again. Well, they followed Yahweh. 
And then they began following Baal. And as they followed Baal, they found out that he, the master God, enslaved them. And they cried out to Yahweh again, oh God, save us. And God saved them. And then they went and followed Ashtoreth, the mother goddess of the Canaanites. And when she did her evil stuff to them, they cried out to God and Yahweh saved them again. And they chose God. And then they found Molech, the god of pleasure. And before long, they were sacrificing their babies, setting them on fire in the fields to honor and worship Molech and realize the darkness and the evil that was there. And they cried out to Yahweh again, and God saved them. And I'd love to tell you they finally got it and made it to the other side, but they didn't. Because the history of Israel is constantly going and being indecisive. Whom shall we follow? Hmm, whoever can benefit us at that moment. Indecision. I think it's one of the things that, that kills us as well. Just make a choice. The end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we see God actually saying that, ah, oh, I wish you were hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And God must get frustrated about our indecisive nature. This morning, I want to ask you to make a decision. Either follow God or don't. But if you're going to follow God, go all the way with God. Because otherwise we end up in the trap of the cycle of sin again and we're enslaved and it brings death. And the more we do that, the farther away we get from God. And I believe God is just saying, just choose. And Jesus met a woman in our passage today. She had sinned and she was caught in the very act of adultery. The woman was brought before Jesus and she must have been frightened out of her mind. She knew what all people knew, that somebody caught in the act of adultery would be stoned to death publicly, put to death. Jesus knew this as well. He is the law. He knew the law. He is the righteous one without sin. And I want you to imagine the scene for a moment. As the woman was brought to Jesus, the religious leader saying, we found her in sin. And as they pointed the finger at her, Jesus could probably see the three fingers pointing back at each person who wanted to yell at her. This woman must have been terrified. Now, it would have been a right thing to do for Jesus to have picked up a stone and stoned her. That was the law. When they said, Jesus, what are you going to do? He could have picked up a stone and started the mob violence against her. But we know that he did not do that. That was not Jesus' way. In fact, what I want you to notice is what I think most people miss in this text. Jesus was already seated. And he was teaching. But when the woman was brought to him, he went even lower. Did you see that? What a beautiful passage. As he went to go right on the ground, he put himself lower. That's the God we worship. The God who came to earth, Jesus, the Alpha, the Omega, the King of all, the righteous prince, the, the one who was and is and is to come, the, the glory of all, the angels, worshiping him. He came to earth and became a poor person from Nazareth. God Almighty stooped low. And then when a sinner was brought to him, he stooped low to look in their face. I love what it says in the Psalms. The psalmist said, Psalm 3, verse 3, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. That's why Jesus came, to take our downcast faces and to lift us up, the lifter of our heads. Don't be downcast. Look into the eyes of God and see the one who can judge all people but instead gives them grace. Jesus bent down. The scriptures tell us that Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. Now, we don't know what he wrote, but there are many possibilities, and I'd like to look at some of the possibilities this morning. What did Jesus write? I don't believe the Holy Spirit told us what Jesus wrote for a reason, so that we would ask the question, what did he write? Whenever the Bible repeats something, it's the Bible's way of underlining that point. And here we see Jesus twice writing on the ground. So what did he write? Well, first, in the context of the story, that's a good place to go. I'm trying to figure something out in the Bible, read before what happens. In chapter 7, we find Jesus who went to the temple. And as he's there at the temple on the, day, the last day of that feast, 
as the priests poured out the water upon the sacrifice uh, to remember the wilderness experience where water came from a rock. As they poured out the water, that sacrifice, they'd done that every year. The water gushed forth out of the temple through the cracks of the rock into the public arena, and the people in the crowds cheered at that. But at that particular moment, as Jesus came to the temple and the water gushed forth, just before the pilgrims sang their praises to God, Jesus said, hey, if you're really thirsty, come to me. And by doing so, the religious leaders were furious at Jesus. How dare he interrupt worship to God? The claim of Jesus was simply that he is the fountain of God's water. And this rubbed the religious leaders the wrong way. You, you want to rub religious leaders the wrong way, interrupt church service after they've put a lot of work into it, right? But you know, as we've said it before, if Jesus ever wants to interrupt this worship service, you have free reign. This is for you, Jesus. And we will listen to you, not to our traditions or our ways of thinking about the all. We'll listen to you, Jesus. Well, they were upset at Jesus because he interrupted their worship service. It is possible that Jesus, as he sat there, knowing that they had rejected him as the fountain of life, which he is, it is possible that on his finger, with his finger writing on the sand, he may have written the words of Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah's words. The prophet said in chapter 17, verse 13, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Jesus may have written that. all night long because Jesus had made the claim he was the living water the religious leaders fumed with anger they filled with hatred toward this carpenter from Nazareth this poor man who somehow had the attention of all the crowds and they were furious at him they were trained they were religious they had their long garments they were authorized by the temple a carpenter from Nazareth who is he to tell us what to do and as it began to plot in their minds, evil took over their hearts as it had done time and time again. And they came up with a way to trap Jesus. Let's find a woman caught in adultery. How do you do that? It might be that they had planted a man to tempt a woman. Perhaps a man raped a woman. We don't know, but how else could somebody be caught in the very act of adultery? And Jesus saw right through this. As they pushed the woman toward him, Jesus, bending down, I think was furious because he knew what the scripture said. Where was the man? If you're caught in the very act, you'll get both of them. And Jesus was furious, I believe, it would not be very long before most people in Judaism in the first century would reject their religious leaders too. They were tired of the manipulation. They were tired of going to worship God and finding that they were being ripped off through the money changers. And then Jesus came and he threw them out. They were tired of the hypocrisy of religion. They were tired of those who, who played the game of being better than others. And then they saw Jesus and he was refreshing. And they said, that's what we want. And we see in Acts, the sixth chapter, that many priests became obedient to the faith of Jesus because they were tired of those higher up and their manipulations. They could see into the heart of their religious leaders who would trap a woman and try to kill her. Who does that? As soon as the poor woman was caught, she was thrown in prison. The whole night she waited in chains for her death. She knew that the act of adultery meant being stoned to death. And by this time, by the time she was taken to Jesus and thrown to him, she would have wept many hours long the night before, perhaps losing all hope. I have a suspicion that Jesus looked at her and grew very angry because he's the protector of people. And he probably, well, let me just say this. If you need someone for you, Jesus is for you. He will protect you. He's your good shepherd. 
He will fight any evil or any danger that comes your way. That's Jesus. Now, Jeremiah's text may have been what Jesus wrote. We don't know. There's another possibility of what he might have written in the sand. There was a scripture from the prophet Hosea in which God grew tired of men blaming women for sexual sins. That was exactly what was happening during Hosea, the prophet's days. The men were condemning the prostitutes, yet making the women be prostitutes. Hosea 4, verses 13 and 14 says, They sacrifice on the mountaintops, and they burn offerings on the hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, where the shade is pleasant. But your daughters are turned to prostitution, and your daughters-in-law to adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they, return, when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Jesus was angry at those men, I believe. How dare you put this woman in that position? I think Jesus felt that their crimes were far worse than what the woman had done. There's a third possibility. Jeremiah, Hosea. He, Jesus may have written the Ten Commandments. It's interesting to me that we are told in Exodus 31 that the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God on the tablets, on the rock. We learn later on that, 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 that the God who appears to Moses is Jesus himself before he's called Jesus, the word of God. And now we find Jesus sitting there teaching the people and writing down to, and bending down to write with his finger on the ground. Think about that image. The religious leaders must have seen that image and think, why is he writing on the ground? And it would have sparked within them the, the finger of God writing the law. What Jesus would point out is that we've all broken the law of God all of us. The Ten Commandments, when was the last time you went through them? Do you see where you broke them? Here's what we find out with the Ten Commandments. They're like a chain. You break one, you fall. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image. Do we have other gods? Money? Power? Position? You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. You ever misused God's name? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I'm guilty of that. God commands a day of rest one day a week. Have you ever worked seven days in a row or eight or nine or ten? Honor your father and mother. Have you kept this? You shall not murder. Well, I've never murdered anyone. Wait a minute. We find out in the New Testament, as Jesus indicates, whenever we take the breath from someone, we've murdered them. Whenever we do something to someone that makes them go, oh, we have murdered their life. Thou shalt not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Okay, I've not broken this command. Wait a minute, Jesus. You told me in the Gospels that whenever you look at another person lustfully, you commit adultery in their heart, in your hearts. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Gossip? Slander? Whenever we take a person who is made in the image of God and we somehow bring their name lower, we've broken that command. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. No problem there. You should see my neighbor's wife. Not a problem. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I used that at the first service and they laughed too. But then Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us that coveting somebody's wife means everyone is your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. When I see the Ten Commandments, I look at them all and I say, God, I think I've broken every one of them somehow. It's not about what chain I broke. I broke them all. Perhaps you have as well. You see the effect of when Jesus says, 
Whoever is without sin cast the first stone. No wonder they all walked away. Maybe Jesus wrote the sentence of the law that said not to commit adultery. This occurs three times in the Torah. It's written once in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. We find it in Leviticus 20, verse 10. It says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are put to death. Both. You hear the word both? Deuteronomy 22, verse 22 says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. The point is, that's the law these religious leaders were bringing to Jesus, and they could not see the hypocrisy of what they were doing. Where's the man? I can imagine Jesus bending low. I can imagine him saying in his mind, do you dare to set up this woman as a trap for sin? Don't you know that this woman is a person, a child of God, a daughter, who is going to lose her life any moment? Are you mad? Do you burn with hatred so much for the sinners that you can't recognize your own sin? And we're all sinners. But we're not bad people. When we hold ourselves to the standard of other people, we're not too bad. The standard is God. And none of us will make it. Even the lawgiver Moses couldn't make it until Jesus came. Let any of you, Jesus said, who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And notice what he says after saying those words. It is a very dangerous moment. Let any of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And it says, and then Jesus stooped down to write in the sand again. That was very dangerous because at any second, Jesus could have felt the rocks being thrown or be hit himself. But there was silence. Or, or maybe there was the sound of rocks being dropped. One by one. From the oldest to the youngest. Why from the oldest to the youngest? Because the more we live in this life, the more we ought to learn that we can't judge other people. Because we got enough of judgment for ourselves. And the rocks hit the ground. And Jesus probably lifted the woman up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Now, this is a very telling dialogue. Let me tell you what it means to a Jewish person in his day. Jesus was not saying, hey, you didn't sin, no problem. We'll just sweep it under the carpet. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, according to the law, there must be two or three witnesses testifying to the crime. And when he says, where are your accusers? They're gone, she said. We have no case. This is what I love about Jesus. He knows our sins. He deals with our sins. And next week we'll see him on the cross bearing our sins. Oh, I can hardly say that. But he says to her, look, if you have no accusers, you got no case. And here's the beauty of what we see in that passage is we know that we're sinners, we know that we have sins, but Jesus removes the sin from us. He also removes the accusers from us. Do you hear that? There is one who wants to accuse you all life long. His name's the devil. The word shaitan means the accuser, Satan. He wants to point out, hey, God, look, there's Dave. See what he did? Hey, God, there's Hephzibeth. See what she did? And Jesus stands there and said, get out of here. You have no case against my daughter, my son. That's Jesus. He removes the accusers. Therefore, Paul could write in the book of Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus has done for us. It is wonderful. Oh, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would look upon the worst of all sinners, lift up her head, and make the accusers go away. That's what he can do for you. And this morning, you might be stuck in that cycle that we've looked at week after week after week where we stray from God, we sin, we end up becoming enslaved. 
We cry out, oh God, help me. God sends a Savior. Savior comes and brings us salvation. And that cycle continues again and again and again in our lives. But in this passage, and the reason I wanted to preach it this morning, we find Jesus telling someone this. All right. You've been forgiven. Go and sin no more. Break the cycle. We don't know what happened to this woman. We don't know what happened to her. I hope one day we will see her, and I'd love to sit down and talk with her. I'd love to see the smile on her face and to relive the joy in her heart as she met Jesus. I think she probably did receive God's forgiveness and say, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be changed. Because she had experienced the moment of death because of the sin in her life. And Jesus freed her up, and she probably said, that's what I want to walk in for the rest of my life. Friends, if you don't know what God's forgiveness feels like, if you don't know, I think you all do, but if you don't, or if you need it this morning, if you need to be freed from anything, addictions, problems, sins, Jesus can set you free. And the more we experience the freedom that he brings, the more we want to walk in it and say, I don't want that other stuff. It's wrong, it's bad, it takes me down, it's fake, it's plastic, I'm tired of it. Because Jesus can offer you the real stuff, the real life, where your bellies flow with living water, as Jesus said, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. I'll give you something to drink. No more of the fake stuff. There's a story about a father, as we end the message today, who loved his daughter so much, he wanted to give her something very special. She was now reaching womanhood, and Throughout the years, they had a great relationship. He came to her and he said, Honey, I gave you, many years ago, I gave you the necklace you're wearing. You love the necklace. It's a pearl necklace, but, honey, it's costume jewelry. Would you give it back to me? And the girl said, Dad, no, I I can't give this up. This is precious to me. It means everything to me. Month after month, the father kept coming to his daughter and saying, Honey, that pearl necklace is costume jewelry. I gave it to you once. I want, to, I want it back. Can I have it back? And the girl said, no. I, I, Dad, I can't give it up. Finally, one day, the father asked the daughter, honey, please, would you give this to me? Give me that pearl necklace. It's costume jewelry. The girl trembled and began to cry, and she reached back, and she unclasped the pearl necklace, and she gave it to her father. And the moment she dropped it in his hands, He reached in his pocket and pulled out a brand new real pearl necklace and said, honey, I wanted to give you this. I love the image of that because our heavenly father desperately wants to do that to each one of us. But until we can let go of what we have, the fake stuff, we'll never get the real stuff. Until we can trust in the goodness of God, friends, God is good. And God wants to bless your life. And God wants to give you the best in your life. God wants to bless you. But until you give up the fake, you'll never get the real. Until you're willing to to say, I'm tired of the cycle of sin and slavery. I'm tired of the sin for what it's doing to me. I give it up. I yield it to you. You will never know the power of God that could be upon your life this morning. We've said this for weeks. I want to say it again. Jesus loves you. You are a victor. No longer are you to be a victim. Amen? That's the power of God working within you. I told you this morning I wanted us to come to a moment of decision. Because like the squirrel that made me go, come on, just make a decision. I think God is probably feeling the same about all of us. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will you go back to the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the Molechs and the, well, you keep naming the gods and find the slavery that they give? They'll promise you a lot of good stuff, but they'll never deliver on it. They'll only enslave you. Or will you go and choose to be with God? And God wants to bless you because God is good and you are his daughter and you are his son. Go. Sin no more. Watch what happens. Let's pray. 
Oh God, we thank you so much for breaking the cycle of sin and slavery in our lives. And sometimes we keep choosing the false gods of this world who promise us things and always enslave us. And we're tired of the plastic stuff. Give us the good stuff. Jesus, you offer it to us. Help us to let go of those things that are, that are hurting our relationship with you. And help us to realize and actualize the victory that could be ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray this morning for, for all of us that we would decide, that, that we would decide to follow your ways and experience your joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your forgiveness and love. Thank you that you are for us. You are the lifter of our heads. And you've got incredible things if we'll just yield our lives to you. Bless us so we can glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 915 and 1115. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.